So I think I'd better just spend a few minutes and go back over some of the things that I may have glossed over. Um, what do I mean by external mass transfer? Okay. We had a molecule of solute out here somewhere in the fluid phase, in the mobile phase, outside the particle. It's external to the, the particle, where it wants to go, because the stationary phase is inside the particle. Okay, so there's a, there's a driving force for the solute to go inside the particle. Um, so how does it get from somewhere outside the particle to the outer surface of the particle? Well, it's in the moving phase. So to a certain extent, it's going to get from here over to the surface of the particle by convection. It's just going to be carried with the flow of the moving phase. But it can also get there by the process of diffusion. <clears throat> you can never turn diffusion off unless you go to absolute zero degrees Kelvin. Molecules will diffuse. So there's two contributions to mass transfer outside or external to the particle convection and diffusion. Now the combined effect of the two of them is, is lumped together um, in a number that we call the mass transfer coefficient. Which for a spherical particle you can write the mass transfer coefficient as this this rate constant, a good old-fashioned rate constant, meaning it has units of inverse time, times the diameter of the particle divided by 6. The 6 is a geometrical factor that comes from the assumption of a spherical particle. <clears throat> this number has units of length per unit time, because the rate constant is units of inverse time. Now, the, the engineers have found it to be very effective to summarize experimental measurements of, of these mass transfer coefficients through a number called the Sherwood number. And that is defined as a measure of the particle size for a sphere it's the diameter. The mass transfer coefficient, which is what you measure, and a diffusion coefficient, which is something you can also measure. And this set of numbers now has, has uh, no units. Because this is length. This is length per unit time. So that's length squared per unit time. And diffusion coefficients are length squared per unit time. So it's a dimensionless mass transfer rate coefficient. And it's, it's the actual rate of mass transfer relative to the rate of diffusion. Relative to the rate of diffusion. And you can measure these numbers and relate them to physical properties of the fluid. Those physical properties of the fluid are, are lumped together in this the Schmidt number. The Schmidt number has nothing to do with velocity, the, the, the rate at which the fluid is moving. It has to do with the physical properties of the liquid, namely its viscosity, its density, and diffusion coefficients of solutes in that fluid but not velocity. But since, if you think about what I just said about external transport, there's a convective contribution. There's also going to be a dependence on the velocity of the fluid. And that comes in in the Reynolds number. And that's, 
That's basically what we're talking about. So essentially then, this external mass transfer coefficient, KMT, is the rate of movement of the solute from outside the particle to the particle surface. Now, once the particle enters a pore of the stationary, of the, of the support particle, I sometimes slip and call it the stationary phase, but that's not truly accurate. The porous particle may only, is sometimes often only just an inner carrier of the stationary phase. It per se doesn't cause retention. The stationary phase may be coated inside the, the porous particle. But once the solute enters the pores of the particle, that's now no longer external mass transfer, that's internal mass transfer. There is no convection in the pores in 99.99% of chromatography, there's no convection in the pore. The only way this stuff can move around in the pore is by diffusion. Now, let me take one pore and blow it up really big. So that's a pore. The surface of the pore is usually uh, certainly in the modern era of liquid chromatography, the, the surface of the pore is coated with some very, very thin film of stationary phase. So I'm going to thin film of stationary phase. There's our solute molecule. What's inside the pore is not a vacuum. Okay, it, in the case of gas chromatography, it would be a gas. It would be the carrier gas. In the case of liquid chromatography, it would be it would be stagnated mobile phase. So, outside the film is is mobile phase. Now, our solute has two ways of moving through this pore. It can, it can move by diffusion in the stagnated mobile phase inside the pore, or if the solute molecule is in the film of stationary phase, it can diffuse in that film of stationary phase. That's called surface diffusion. Okay. This, this we would call DS, and this we would call DSM. And the diffusion in both phases taken together is happening in parallel. And when we combine them in parallel, that's what we call diffusion in the stationary zone. The stationary zone includes the mobile phase that's inside the particles, and it includes the film of stationary phase inside the particle, and that would be DSZ, which incorporates both of those kinds of diffusion taking place in parallel. Hope that nails things down a little better for you. Now, the other day I made a made a very small error. I thought this was k double prime, but it's actually k prime. And all of these plots were computed uh, using the um, the internal retention factor, uh, typical of a porous particle, fully porous particle for HPLC, which works out to be. 
I wrote 0.49, but if you want to call it 0.5, that's okay. It's just an estimate. This is probably the upper end of, of the estimates. And so now, if we vary the K prime, that's the K prime for uh, K prime equal to 20. And looking at the form of the equation, K prime over 1 plus K prime, the whole thing squared. As I make K prime bigger, there's going to be less and less and less. And now this is K prime of 0. And the reason that this final curve with K prime of 0 is not 0, but is finite, is because I'm allowing a finite internal porosity of the particle. And so even if there's no chemical retention, the stuff is going to go into the pores and has to diffuse, and it's going to take a little while to get to equilibrium, even though it's not retained by the stuff on the, on the wall of the pore. In the case of, of uh, internal mass transfer, that works out to be the reduced plate height. Um, and this, this works out to be the, uh, the stationary zone diffusion coefficient relative to the mobile phase diffusion <coughs> coefficient. And this is the fraction of the mobile phase that's inside the pore relative to the total amount of mobile phase in the column. And again, I'm assuming a fully porous particle. And these will be the K prime values. And this dependence is K double prime to the first power divided by 1 plus K prime squared. So it's going to look different. Here's, here's K prime 0. Here's K prime 1. Here's K prime 3. So the AGTP versus K prime goes up, goes through a maximum, and comes back down. And as you make it bigger and bigger, it comes down and down and down and down and down until so when you get a really big K prime, this, this squared term dominates, and so the internal mass transfer eventually doesn't contribute much at all. This is very different to K prime dependence than the external mass transfer, which goes up and reaches a limit. So whether external mass transfer is dominant or internal mass transfer is dominant, depends very much on how much retention there is. And if there's a lot of retention, then external is going to be dominant. And if there's a little bit of retention, it could be about the same for both internal and external, depending upon whether it's a porous particle or a non-porous particle and, and, and other factors. So, so this is sort of another way of saying that without doing, without getting into the arithmetic. Here's plots of concentration of solute versus distance. Zero is dead center of the particle. Big R is the radius of the particle. DF is the radius plus um, the, is that DF? I shouldn't have given that df, let me call that D, dn for Nernst layer. That's the outer edge of the Nernst layer where we're really in the moving phase that's moving rapidly, not the stagnated mobile phase. Now if all the resistance is inside the particle, then the concentration versus distance will have a, a slope to it. But then it'll be flat in the Nernst layer because the Nernst layer is so thin that it's perfectly equilibrated. On the other hand, if you have a very, very, very tiny particle, the, the, the inside is going to be flat, it's going to be equilibrated, 
You've got a slope outside. This is dominance of the resistance outside or external resistance. If both are significant, well, you don't know what the plot's going to look like. One could be a little more controlling than the other, but you're going to have you're going to have concentration gradients both inside the particle and outside the particle. And in, in this case, the two HETP terms would be about the same. In this case, the HETP outside the particle would be dominant. In this case, the HETP inside the particle would be dominant. Sometimes it's obvious what it has to be. If we have gas chromatography with a bed packed with particles, the mobile phase is a gas. The stationary phase is a liquid. Diffusion in liquids is four, five, six orders of magnitude slower than diffusion in gases. You know, it's a no-brainer you know where the resistance is going to be. It's going to be where the diffusion coefficient is very, very small. And so in gas chromatography, typically the stationary phase is the dominant resistance to mass transfer. And that tells you you want to use a very thin film of stationary phase. In liquid chromatography, the moving phase and the stationary phase have roughly the same diffusion coefficients. It depends on exactly the circumstances as to who's going to be the bigger problem. So you have to make everything small. So um, that, that finishes up our discussion of um, the mass transfer resistance in a packed bed. Now, when we were working on that, we set the axial dispersion coefficient dAx equal to zero. We said there's no longitudinal broadening, and we said that there's no eddy dispersion. Now, we're going to allow there to be dispersion and diffusion, longitudinal broadening, but we're going to assume rapid equilibrium between the phases. If you want to solve the whole problem, good luck. It's, it's really mathematically a nightmare, and I don't think it's ever really been solved. So, now, here's Here's the diffusion-like term, because it's got partial C, partial C squared. But this is not a diffusion coefficient. This is a dispersion coefficient, meaning it includes diffusion plus the flow-induced broadening, like in the open tubular column where we had the combined influences of diffusion and, and, uh, and flow. Already jumped ahead and assumed equilibrium, which is why there's no dQdt. I've replaced the dQdt, the stationary phase kinetic term. I've said it's in equilibrium, so I can relate the Q and the C by an equilibrium constant, and that brings in um, my retention factor. This term is just convection in and out of a thin element <coughs> in the column. This is the rate of accumulation of solute in the moving phase and in the stationary phase in that thin element. So we have to solve this problem. Now this is, this is a different problem because in all the preceding cases, we set this side equal to zero. And we didn't have to worry about a d squared c dz squared term. But now we got a d squared c dz squared term.
term to deal with, and that makes it mathematically more complicated. But the problem has been solved, and here's the solution to the problem. It's, it's something that looks vaguely Gaussian, but it's not exactly Gaussian. Here's the concentration as a function of distance along the column. So z is 0 at the inlet, z equals big L at the e exit of the column. t is time after the sample is injected. We're assuming that the sample is injected in a very, very narrow, essentially infinitely narrow pulse at time equal to 0. So the sample goes in like that, not in like that. Um, so this term really represents the total amount of sample that's injected at t equal to 0. It is, in fact, the area under the peak. Um, <clears throat> Z is distance along the column. T is time from the injection point. D prime is this axial dispersion coefficient divided by 1 plus K prime. U prime works out to be the interstitial velocity divided by 1 plus k prime. And, and I said that this was, this was not quite Gaussian in form. And the reason it's not quite Gaussian in form is the, the presence <laughs> of a t cubed there. An exact Gaussian, would, that would just be t to the first power. And an exact Gaussian, there would be no t there at all. No, 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 no. That would, that would, that t would be there. That t would be there. It turns out that this form really dominates the peak shape. So if, if there are enough plates on the column, this approaches very closely an exact Gaussian. But if there are only a few plates on the column, maybe 50, this has a little tail to it. But who uses a, a column with 50 plates on it? Okay, so. <clears throat> Um, the the uh, moments of this at z equal to l look like this. And here's the first moment. So it's the dead time plus 1 plus k prime. So the center of gravity, even of the non-Gaussian peak, the center of gravity works out to be the same thing it always works out to be. And the second central moment works out to be um, something that the random walk model tells you it works out to be. But the derivation is entirely different. You don't have to go through any physical argument to get this. It just comes out of the mathematics. So now that we have the first moment and we have the second moment, we can calculate an HETP. Or rather, we can calculate the number of plates on the column. And when we have the number of plates on the column and we know the length of the column, we can calculate an HETP. And lo and behold, it tells us pretty much what we've got to expect we're going to see. Where this is not a diffusion coefficient, this is a dispersion coefficient. So this guy includes diffusion, but it also depends on velocity. The problem with a packed bed is that we don't know how it depends on velocity. In the open tube, we were able to solve the hydrodynamics. We were able to solve the Navier-Stokes equation. But in a packed bed, 
there, there is no known solution. Even in a perfectly random packed bed, there's no known solution. If you assume a perfectly ordered bed, there is no known solution. You can do computer solutions and simulate it until the cows come home, but there's no nice equation for representing this as a function of velocity. The way we get it is by doing experiments, the old-fashioned way. So I'm saying this again. This is what we were able to derive mathematically by solving in the Navier-Stokes equation for the open tube. We can't do that now. So we're simply going to recognize that the axial dispersion coefficient is going to depend upon the velocity of the mobile phase. It's going to depend upon the particle diameter. It might well depend upon the diameter of the column. It could. It's certainly going to depend upon the diffusion coefficient of the stuff in the mobile phase. It's going to depend upon the physical properties of the fluid, certainly its viscosity, its density. These are at least the principal things that it could depend upon. And we're going to get at this by doing measurements and seeing how we can represent the data. So just to remind you again, is this is the mess that we're trying to deal with. We're trying to predict the dispersion caused by the flow of the mobile phase over the bed of particles randomly packed in some kind of tube. And I showed this picture when we were talking about the random walk model, and Gidding says that there are five different kinds of velocity heterogeneities in, in a packed bed. Um, the trans column, which extends over the entire diameter of the column, of the long range interchannel, the differences between tightly packed channels and loosely packed channels, um, velocity heterogeneity on the scale of a particle, velocity heterogeneity on the scale of the space between two particles that are bridging. Um, and then there's, there's the short range interchannel. So that's two channels that are a few particles separated, not separated by the diameter of the whole column. Now I want to show you some experimental data that proves that this problem exists. And this, is, this is a really neat experiment that um, a fellow, Mark Whiteman, at Chapel Hill did about 20 years ago. Uh, Whiteman is not a chromatographer. He's an electrochemist. And his main claim to fame is that he makes ultra-micro electrodes. It has a diameter of one micron. And that's, that's the one micron diameter tip of an electrode where I can do electrochemistry by setting the potential of this electrode relative to some reference electrode and oxidizing or reducing compounds as they can pass the tip. So what he did is he got an HPLC column, the 4.6 millimeter column. And this was a long time ago, so I believe these were 10 micron particles. So the, you got yourself a regular HPLC column with particles packed in there. This is the, this is the downstream end of the column. So we're going to inject sample into this column over here somewhere, five, maybe, maybe 15 centimeters back that way. Okay? So it's a regular HPLC other, other than this. And we're going we're gonna to place the tip of this electrode 
where I'm showing it. And then we're going to move it. We're going to move it to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, to there. We're going to inject. We're going to record the signal that we see at the downstream end of the frit. You've got to have this red stuff. That's the frit that holds the stationary phase in the column. It won't stay there without a frit. It'll just get pushed out by the flow of the mobile phase. <clears throat> so we're going we're gonna to keep injecting and record, inject and record, move the, move the electrode, tip, record, move the electrode, and measure a bunch of chromatograms. Okay, so this is the chromatogram recorded with the microelectrodes. This chromatogram is recorded with the electrode as close to the dead center of the, the column as he could get. And, and this one is recorded with the electrode right about there. He thinks it's just inside the wall of the column. Here's the, the wall of the column. And so that's just inside. Chromatograms are not the same. The peak of this is, is substantially earlier than the peak near the wall. And not only that, <coughs> this one is a little wider and it's definitely tailed. This one's a little more symmetrical and it's a bit narrower. Now, this solid curve here is the is the recorded curve. If he he does the chromatography in a conventional way, no microelectrode collects the eluent and runs it through a detector. So it's it's seeing the average composition of the fluid. It's, it's averaging across the entire um, cross-section of the column. The circles is what he computes by averaging together all of these chromatograms run at different positions in the column. This is clearly wider than any of these because he's, he's, at, he's looking at zones of different velocity. He's looking directly at the eddy dispersion effect. Now, here's his reconstructed chromatogram again. And here's concentration over the, the maximum concentration versus the radial position on the frit. So here's the frit again. R of zero is right here. And then the plus R would be there and minus R would be there. And, and there is frit here that, that lops over the, the end of the tube. And he's actually got a chromatogram there. That's this chromatogram and this chromatogram. So you can see that it's, they're, they're, it's not homogeneous. If it were homogeneous, this plot would be flat. It wouldn't, it wouldn't depend upon radial position. <clears throat> Here he calculates the reduced plate height. And those are the dots that are filled in. And this is, this is the relative retention time relative to the retention time dead center of the column. And you can see these retention times are almost 3% higher than in the center of the column. And these are 
like 1% lower than in the center of the column. That's a 4% spread in retention time. That, these all get mixed together. And this is what you actually see when you have a conventional detector. That's a lot of dispersion from the eddy effect across the column. This is the trans-column broadening term that Giddings was talking about back here. Um, he, he did this with an old column and the results are uh, not, not terribly, terribly different. So this is a real problem. Now, our friends, the chemical engineers, um, don't do things the same way analytical chemists do things. They study massive systems. This is not an HPLC column. It's not a GC column. This is pipes packed with particles. I don't know how big the pipes were. I don't know how big the particles were. This is a bunch of experiments that they've smooshed together. It's a log-log plot, again. And they fit the data, and they find that the axial dispersion coefficient relative, relative to the diffusion coefficient of the mobile phase is equal to about 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times the reduced velocity, that is UE dp divided by the diffusion coefficient raised to the one-half power. That's what this plot looks like. So we can take this dispersion coefficient and use it in our equations for the HETP for axial dispersion. If we multiply this out, us that in the limit of zero velocity, the axial dispersion coefficient is about seven-tenths of the mobile phase diffusion coefficient. A long time ago, we were talking about gas chromatography. I said that the, the obstruction factor of the particles caused longitudinal diffusion broadening to be about 0.7 of the pure diffusion coefficient. That's one of the experiments that goes into my, that statement. This bed was a, there's no retention. The particles in the bed are non-porous. There's no chromatography, there's no pores. So this is pure non-chromatographic stuff that causes this broadening. Diffusion and flow. Okay, so I'm going to show you a bunch of equations now that summarize um, the eddy dispersion. This, this is the Van Diemter equation, and Van Diemter says that the longitudinal dispersion in the absence of retention, this, this is our diffusion term, and this is our eddy dispersion term, and this eddy dispersion, according to Van Diemter, does not depend on velocity. That completely contradicts this data. There's nobody I know anymore who knows any chromatography at all who accepts the Van Diemter equation as being anything other than a convenient fitting equation. The Giddings coupling theory, which we talked about when we were going through the details of the random walk, give us the, the longitudinal diffusion term, 
plus an eddy dispersion term that is it has a complex velocity dependence. And we know that this term looks something like that. And if we could get the high enough velocity, it would go flat. <clears throat> In this region here, that could pass for a new to the one half. This equation here is what's what's known as Knox's empirical equation. It's not theoretically derived at all. This is he took an HPLC column, he packed the HPLC column with with particles that were non-porous, there was no stationary phase, there were small particles, he packed them as good as he could, and he was able to measure this curve over a fairly wide range in velocities without ever getting into turbulence. And Knox says that it looks to him Like something like the reduced velocity to the one-third power. Now the one-third looks like it's theoretically derived, but the number he actually came up with in his paper was 0.31. But everybody said, oh, what the hell? One-third is easy to remember. So it is a purely empirical fit. What I just told you about from the chemical engineers is it looks to them like it's more like the one-half power of the velocity. I'm going to tell you that it depends exactly on how you pack the column. And any one of these might fit better except this one. It's extremely difficult unless you've got data over a really, really wide range in velocities to tell the difference between these three equations. You need a lot of data points and you need to cover a very wide velocity range to detect differences that you could prove statistically that these were different. Okay, so now, our total HETP then is the sum of all of the broadening factors inside the column, which means longitudinal diffusion, eddy dispersion, external mass transfer, and internal mass transfer, plus all of the extra column factors, meaning the connecting tubing, the injection profile, and the detector response. All of those have to, are added up and are buried somewhere in that single term. But it's not a single thing. It's a combination of all that goes on outside the column. And as I said some weeks ago now, as the columns get smaller and smaller, and they get smaller and smaller because we want to do faster and faster and faster chromatography, and faster means smaller. This gets worse and worse and worse. And we need better and better and better equipment. And we have to do things more and more carefully. So to put some form on these, this is the form of the longitudinal diffusion. It's an inverse dependence on reduced velocity. You just saw four, three or four different versions of the eddy dispersion with different, different velocity dependencies. The external mass transfer resistance depends upon the velocity to some power less than one. And that's because it results both from diffusion and convection. 
the more it depends on convection, the lower the power alpha is. And this is the internal resistance to mass transfer term. It's a pure diffusion event so that it depends on the velocity to the first power. <clears throat> goes on inside a column. Next thing we're going to take up is gas chromatography. Um, we'll start that on Friday. The reason I talk about gas chromatography before liquid chromatography is that in gas chromatography you've got a, a moving phase which is a gas. It's helium or hydrogen rarely, rarely nitrogen. You would never use oxygen as a carrier gas in gas chromatography unless you wanted to burn your compound. Um, <clears throat> but those gases that I just mentioned at, let's say, 100 degrees centigrade and low pressure like one, one and a half atmospheres, one and a half atmospheres. He did his dissertation in gas chromatography. They're virtually ideal. And so they have no effect on the retention. They have no effect on the chromatography, except they have different diffusion coefficients. So they would have an effect on the peak width, but only in the mobile phase. <clears throat> so it's simpler because you really only have to worry about what's going on in one phase, the stationary phase. Liquid chromatography is a horse of another color. The mobile phase is just as important as the stationary phase and sometimes more important. And so you have to understand what's going on in both phases simultaneously. And furthermore, the mobile phase dissolves into the stationary phase. So that in liquid chromatography, when you change the mobile phase, you're also changing the stationary. And that makes understanding what goes on at least twice as complicated as gas chromatography. So we'll do gas chromatography first. <clears throat> okay, see you Friday.